All right, everyone, good evening. Today is Sunday, October 17th, and we're going to run through a lecture on options, talking about vanillas, Greeks, and then introduce a couple very common spreads. All right, so for vanilla options, let's step back a step. What is an option? An option is a contractual agreement between two parties, the buyer and the seller. A call is the right but not obligation to buy a stock at a predetermined price at a predetermined time, where a put is the opposite, the right but not obligation to sell a stock at a predetermined price at a predetermined time. And this is reflected pretty clearly in the payoff structures you can see on the bottom left and right respectively. The price of a call or the value of a call payoff at maturity is going to be the difference between the stock price at maturity and the strike price. So if the stock price is greater than the strike price, we see that upward sloping line. However, if it is less than, we see it capped at a floor of zero. Um, so this creates a nonlinear payoff structure, which is the beauty of options. This nonlinearity is absolutely key. On the put side, we see that we have an infinite possible profit on the downside, where you have this bearish exposure where you want the stock to go down and then we'll have the value of the put increase. A call is going to be the opposite where you are bullish and you want the value of the stock to increase. The difference between this uh, x-axis and the negative 200 point down here is representative of the premium of the option, which is the amount it costs to buy this protection. Essentially think of options like insurance in the sense that you do have this downside protection on um, both sides. So there are four things you can do with vanilla options. On the top left, you see an indication of a long call. This means you are buying a call. You can also sell a call. Selling a call is not the same as being long a put. If we look at these two graphs, we see that they are not the same. They are not reflections of each other. They are most definitely not the same. If you look at the difference between a long call and a short call, it's just a reflection over the x-axis. So whatever happens to the long holder, the inverse is going to happen to the short holder. However, the short call and long put holders are both going to have bearish exposures as indicated by this red color in the box here. Long calls and short puts, not surprisingly, are both going to have bullish exposures. However, note that when you are short an option, you have a capped possible return and a limitless possible loss. This is on the um, this is a limitless possible loss on the upside movements when you're short a call because you are bearish, and on the downside movements when you are short a put. Again, you have limitless possible upside when you are long an option. This is something that'll come into play when we discuss the Greeks in a couple of minutes. So for a couple key terms, uh, let's talk about the buyer and the seller. The buyer is the person who decides to exercise and buy and sell 100 shares of the underlying security, whether that's a stock, an index, um, an FX pair, it's usually done in lot sizes of 100. The collar put holder is going to be long the security and thus has a payoff similar to what you see on the right if it's long a call or the reflection over the y-axis if it is uh, long a put. For the seller, um, that's the same as being right as writing an option. So when you are writing an option, you are going short an option. You have an obligation to buy or sell 100 shares of the underlying for a call or a put, respectively. This difference between an obligation and a right comes into play because it means that for non-optimal exercise, you're still going to have to exercise, which is why you have that limitless downside exposure. Um, so why do options exist? We've got two good reasons and two uh, consequences of their existence. On the benefit side, we see that the leverage is definitely there as one contract equates to 100 shares of the underlying stock. This allows you to magnify returns very quickly. With regard to capital outlay, this goes hand in hand because these are going to be significantly cheaper than the outright stock purchase. With regard to time and again, leverage, these also come up on the downside. So time, not only do you have to guess that the stock is going to go up correctly if you are along a call, but you also need it to go up to at least a certain point by a certain date. 
So you have this finite expiration date, which is sitting at the back end of your contract. With regard to leverage, it can hurt you quickly. It can hurt you as much as it can. On the upside, it can it could even hurt you even more. So you have this exposure, which isn't necessarily good. If you're right, it's great. If you're wrong, it could be really bad. All right, so on the right-hand side of the screen, this is what a trade for a long call would look like. Obviously, this is a bullish position. You see a break even right here in the middle, which is two rungs up on the gray line. However, the rest of this option is sitting below. Um, we have this concept of theta, which we'll touch on in a second, which represents the convergence between the theoretical um, and the realized value, which are indicative of the intrinsic versus extrinsic value of the option. As time decays, the extrinsic value will fall because that's what's representative of your time premium. The idea is the more time that you have for an option to become in the money, the better it's going to be for the holder of that option because there's more opportunities that it could go in the money. So um, with that in mind, you see the payoffs initially um, above with this dark line today. And then as you near expiry um, a month later, it's going to converge to the theoretical price, which is just going to be representative of the intrinsic value of the option as this extrinsic value decays. All right, so to continue, um, let's put in some mathematical terms. If the stock price is less than the strike, you're gonna have a call that's out of the money. And you're gonna have a put that's in the money. If the stock price is equal to the strike, both the calls and puts are going to be at the money. If you have a strike price, if you have a stock that's trading above the strike price, your call is going to be in the money and your put is going to be out of the money. Regardless if you're long or short, um, it's still referred to by the same terminology of being ITM, ATM, or OTM. However, um, do note that if you are, say, short a call, you want the call to be out of the money. The more out of the money, the better if you have a short position on the call. However, if you have a long position on the call, you want it to be more in the money. Uh, for terminology we'll see later, just know that anytime you see K or X, that is going to be indicative of the strike price. Stock um, is the price of the underlying security, S. Sometimes you'll see it denoted as S sub T. The risk-free rate, R, is uh, used for discounting. This is oftentimes either the 10-year or 30-year treasury. Um, sigma is representative of the implied volatility. Note that this is not variance. This is sigma, which is just like the standard deviation, not the standard deviation squared. And um, T is the time to maturity. Uh, it should be pretty self-explanatory. Oftentimes it's quoted as a fraction of trading days. So there are 252 trading days in a year. Open interest is the number of all contracts and it's going to be updated daily based on the previous day's trading activity. So the idea is whenever you buy an option, somebody else holds that option. So when you buy an option to hold it, or whatever you want to do with it, you're going to have a counterparty and that counterparty will be writing the option. So you are long the option and someone else is short that same option. For premium, that's what we uh, spoke about over here, which is this negative 400, which is the difference between your break even and what it would be at zero. Um, so like when the option is out of the money, what that value is going to be. Um, and also we have the break even, which is the price that the underlying needs to be trading at to not gain or lose any money, which is pretty self-explanatory. There's this really impl important concept here of implied volatility, which is one of the six inputs used in an options pricing model, like the Black-Scholes options pricing model. This is the only one that's not observable in the market itself. And the higher the implied volatility, the higher premium. And for the same reason that for longer dated options, you're also going to have a higher premium. The uh, distribution of implied volatility is normal, which allows us to use it as an assumption in Black-Scholes. So let's talk about some payoff structures just because we define the key terms. We see the strike price here. So this is going to be denoted by either K or, uh, K or X. We have our break-even point, which is up over here. 
we have um, this area where you're still at a loss, but you are doing better because for a call, it's S minus K positive part, which means that um, that's this part right here. Uh, plus, so it's this S minus K positive part minus the premium paid. So here, the premium paid is still greater than the S minus K part. However, this S minus K is still greater than zero. Below this, this is just zero minus your premium. Note here that you do have a limited loss and a limitless profit. So when you have a short call, that's going to be the opposite. You have a limited profit and an unlimited loss. Long puts are also bearish, uh, just like short calls. And you're gonna have a break even, a strike, limited max loss and limitless possible gain on the downside. And you do have uh, downside exposure. One thing to note and something that a lot of people do discuss in terms of valuing call versus put options and why put call, put call parity might not exactly hold in practice is that sure, you do have limitless exposure to the downside. However, the stock price can't go below zero. And so that does add an interesting question and something we can discuss in more detail later and questions following the session. But it does look like, um, obviously, you can have a capped possible um, downside risk just because the stock price can't go below zero. But for our purposes and just generally know that this is going to be essentially limitless and then this will be limited. On the short put side, um, you are gonna have bullish exposure, you have max profit, strike price, break even. Idea is you have, again, a capped maximum gain but a limitless maximum loss because you are short an option. So put call parity is something we mentioned before and let's talk about how to derive it practically. So if you long a share of $50 and buy a put that's also at $50, you're gonna have downside protection from that put option right here, but still have that upside. Huh, sorry, um, so you're still going to have that upside here. You're going to have a bank deposit paying $50. So if you take the discounted future value and that's going to be $50 and also add a long call, you're going to have the same payoff structure that's going to intersect the same points on the graph. This shows the upside from the call being the same as the upside from the share, which, um, which also uses the put option as downside protection and uses cash as downside protection over here. With that in mind, if you take the call and add that to the discounted um, strike price and also add, uh, I guess, equate that to the put plus the stock, you're gonna get to this beauty, beautiful thing called put call parity. So the call and, and put prices are going to be related by this formula over here. So say if you knew everything but the price of the call and wanted to use the price of the put, the price of the stock, and the price of the strike price to get to the price of the call, just subtract this over and then solve that simple equation for the call. Um, the same notation from before holds as indicated here. All right, so Black-Scholes, um, this is the options pricing formula that everyone uses. This is very fundamental, um, Nobel Prize winning. Very, very important here. The idea is that you're going to price both calls and puts by using these formulas. And it uses these key assumptions over here on the right. In addition, um, we wanna talk about how options need to be European. There are two, well, technically three types of options. The first being European, which means that it can only be exercised at maturity. You have American options that can be exercised at any time. And then these things called Bermudans that can be exercised at um, a grid of times between uh, somewhere between Europe and America. So not being called European or American, they are known as Bermudan. Um, as European options assumed here, they can only be exercised at expiration. Another assumption is that markets are efficient and market movements can thus not be predicted. The risk-free rate and volatility of the underlying are supposed to be known and constant. Obviously, this is a bit hard to ensure in practice. However, I guess it would be fair to say that it's typically glazed over to some degree. 
and um, these assumptions are still met. With regard to um, dividends, no dividends are paid out during the life of the option. Uh, and there are also no transaction costs in buying the options. However, the most important assumption from Black Scholes is that the log returns on the underlying asset are normally distributed. So this is something that comes into question when you apply option pricing theory to other things in finance um, with questionable accuracy, partially because of the question of if the log returns are normally distributed. All right. Um, so we can go through the math and I have a proof in the appendix if we want to talk through it, but there's not really a need. Just know that these are the formulas. The N is going to be the normal um, cumulative density function, which is often denoted by phi as well. Um, and then you use D1, D2. Again, you're taking this log, which is in reference to the log returns on the asset being normally distributed. So let's move into Greeks. This is the most exciting part of our discussion so far. We've got three first order Greeks that we want to talk about and then uh, gamma as well. And so for first orders, you've got your delta, vega, theta, and then your second order, you have your gamma. So these are just partial derivatives of the Black-Scholes equation. And the derivative of the change in spot with relation to change in value is going to be delta, change in volatility with relation to value is, is vega, and then change in time of expiry with relation to value is going to be that theta exposure. Gamma is going to be the derivative of um, delta with respect to spot. So it's that second order, basically indicative of the convexity. And these are terms that you'll hear all the time in finance where people talk about the convexity of bonds. That's oftentimes also referred to as gamma because they both do indicate convexity exposure, just like how there is an inflection point for mortgage-backed securities when negative convexity actually does come into play. So same idea of looking for inflection points when you are considering graphs of higher order of polynomials. So theta is also known as time decay as well, just because it is in reference to time passage. And as mentioned before, when you are long an option, you're going to be um, short theta because of that decay of that extrinsic value. All right, so let's start out with the most simple one. Let's define delta. So if delta is at negative 100, that is indicative of a far in the money put. When you're at plus 100, that's a far in the money call. Uh, ATM puts and ATM calls are minus and plus 50 uh, respectively. And then the further you go out of the money, the closer it gets to zero. Sometimes you hear deltas denoted as negative one to, uh, to positive one. Um, and more commonly, you'll hear them described on this uh, negative 100 to zero or zero to positive 100 scale. When delta is positive, you are long exposure to the underlying. Basically, that means you are long. Um, you have a long position, you are bullish. Uh, when you're positive, you want the underlying to rise. And when you are negative, you want the underlying to fall. And so as time passes and all decreases, either one of those things occur, you're going to move further from plus or minus 50. So delta is the rate of change of price from spot. Price and value are interchangeable terms here. Um, definitely a more philosophical con uh, con conversation if you want to get into that. But for the sake of this conversation, let's talk about price and value being the same. And this is the rate of change from spot. So you see um, the idea is when it is way below the money, this is going to be a low delta. Oh, and as you go up here, it's going to become very high delta. Somewhere in the middle, you're going to have a crossover at this 50 point, this 0.5, and this shows that the strike price is going to be about 100. Um, as mentioned before, the change in the call price um, divided by the change in the spot price is going to show this tangent line right here, which is what that delta is. So delta is taking that infinitesimally small um, difference and figuring out what the tangent uh, line is at that exact point the same idea as a fundamental mathematical derivative. On the left, you see delta versus the spot price. 
Um, something to note here is this change is not linear. That should be pretty obvious. This is an S curve, a negative S curve. This S curve changes slope and steepness because of gamma. So the rate of change of delta is going to be gamma. And if you look that as time decays, when we look at this one that only has 0.5 years left, as opposed to one that has two years left, this is so much steeper because it has so much more gamma. Um, and that's something we'll see in a second. So gamma, gamma is the rate of change of delta from spot. Gamma is going to be highest at the money and greater volatility means greater gamma, either in or out of the money. Lower volatility is going to mean lower gamma at the money. And um, so when it's positive, you just want things to move quickly. Essentially, you're sitting long volatility. Gamma and vega are different, but move in parity with each other. They have a positive direct correlation. Negative means that you move slowly regardless, or that you want slow moves regardless of the direction. And this is mirrored for both calls and puts. Sometimes you've got this whole idea of a vega smile. And again, we don't need to get into that today, but that does show that because of increasing demands for puts, especially in the money puts that are used to hedge, where you're going below the money and going long a put um, for like hedging purposes and protection there, there's going to be a slight supply demand imbalance or slight demand imbalance between calls and puts, which could create differences in the gammas and vegas that you see between calls and puts. However, um, just theoretically, your calls and puts are gonna have the same gamma. Um, as implied volatility varies, see that implied volatility is, when implied volatility is the lowest, we're gonna have the highest um, at the money and like the steepest difference in gamma. All right, um, move on. Let's compare delta versus gamma. So this is the first and second order versus spot. If you look to the bottom, we have the formulaic wave for calculating it on the previous slides. We did talk about what um, the normal distribution of D1 would be and normal distribution prime of D1. Um, however, I think it's easiest to look at the graph. You see the delta on the right, um, the right axis on the um, on the red line, and then you have the blue line, which peaks in the middle. Obviously, the peak of the blue line is going to be equivalent to the fifty percent mark for delta. These are calls. Um, I guess this is a call delta. If this was a put delta, it would look the same, but just be the inverse going down this way. Um, again, it's going to be highest right here at the middle. This is something that you're also going to see as we move into thetas and vegas. So um, that'll be a good conversation to have next. Increasing volatility means rising theta and at the money kurtosis increases as maturity nears because when you are at the money, you are gonna have the greatest theta and that's going to be um, exasperated as you get closer to maturity. As time passes, value is going to increase. Um, and if you are negative theta, then as time passes, you are going to lose value on the options. So again, this is a key idea. This is talking about the extrinsic value decaying. So as we go from the 10 day to the five day to the two day, this becomes even more steep, which means that it's even more important and an even bigger driver of value. This formula here in long form explains um, how to actually calculate theta. And note that as time decays, it gets even faster. So like the derivative of time decay is going to accelerate as you near expiry. All right, Vegas, we're running through this pretty quickly. So please do interrupt me if you do have any questions. Vega is the rate of change of price from implied volatility. So that means when it is positive, you want implied volatility to rise. When it is negative, you want implied volatility to fall. And when it is at the money, you want a higher vega, uh, or you will have, sorry, you will have a higher vega. So um, we look at this, the differences that you're seeing as implied volatility increases is this difference as you're going from the blue line out to the green line, it's thicker. Um, I don't know the correct mathematical term, but essentially the distribution is going to be thicker. The tails are going to be fatter. Um, the likelihood and probability density of achieving 
um, achieving results over here um, is going to be substantially higher. Um, so for time to expiration in Vega, you see that as time decays, so we go from the green line to uh, the black line, time has decayed, which lowers this. All right, um, so to move on here, we see that the Vega of different um, implied volatilities. Okay, we touched on that. Uh, that being said, the, uh, the Vega exposure here is going to be the same. Something to note is that Vega and Gamma are, I don't wanna say synonymous, but they both move in parity with each other and are oftentimes used interchangeably, which is one of the reasons that this axis can be labeled Gamma and still be correct. All right, so to review the Greeks on the top left, we have an out of the money call. Um, so this shows all of the Greeks against spot. One that we did not mention here is that um, Rho is another Greek. This is not very important. This is the sensitivity to changes in the risk-free rate. It is not a big driver of options value. So don't kill yourself over that. It truly really isn't that important. Um, the units of change are definitely very small and it doesn't have that big of an effect because the risk-free rate is not going to change much without market conditions changing drastically, which would also affect more prominent inputs to the model. Um, as you see, when it is out of the money, um, your delta is going to begin to climb. It's going to continue to climb and it will um, climb even more as you're in the money. However, if you look to the derivative of that, which will be indicated um, by this gamma exposure, it is heightened when you do hit the money here and then does fall as you go into the money. Um, if you look to this chart, which is probably the easiest way to see it, note that there is a strike price of 100. So everything over here is below um, with this being at the money. And then everything over here is going to be above. Um, Okay, so that pretty much covers it. You have your vegas and your gammas, which as mentioned before, do move in parity with each other, which is this green um, compared to the purple line. So they do move with each other. And then also you have theta decay that's going to be um, heightened before. All right, so just for review, when you are long an option, you are going to be short theta, long vega, and long gamma. When you are short an option, you're going to be the opposite of all of those things. However, your delta is not given here. So when you are long a call, you're going to be delta long because you are bullish on movements of the underlying security. When you are short a call, you're going to be short delta. When you are short delta, that means your delta value is going to be negative. Your long put is going to be negative delta as well because you also have bearish exposure. As you transition to the territory of being short a put, just like when you're allowing a call, you are going to have positive deltas. However, the drivers of theta, vega, and gamma are not if it's a call or a put, but rather, um, but rather are you buying or selling the option? So when you are long, you're gonna be short theta, long vega, long gamma. When you are short, you're going to be long theta and then short beta, short gamma. This is a really important distinction to make because the driver of your delta is the direction of your position. However, the drivers of your thetas, vegas, and gammas is whether or not you are net buying or net selling options. All right, so just to review that's shown here where you are long delta for your long call and short put and then short deltas for your short call and long put. Everything else goes hand in hand with what we just discussed with your vegas and gammas being in parity with one, one another and then the theta is always being the opposite. Okay, so we're gonna go through a couple quick spreads and then uh, I'll let you guys go. With regard to straddles and strangles. So these two trades are pretty much the same thing. The idea is for a straddle, both the call and put have the same strike price where for the strangle, they do not have the same strike price. So because of that, you have this area on the bottom where you essentially have a long put below the long call. So you have the payoff structure from a long put going across and then the payoff structure from a long call 
going across here. So you, you have this area where you are both um, not making money on the call and not making money on the put. And the reason that you do this in, in a long setting is twofold. Firstly, this difference, like this premium that you're paying is probably gonna be a lot lower because the idea is at least one of these is not going to be in the money. So it's going to be cheaper. Um, so your maximum possible loss is probably going to be lower here. In addition, if you are short a strangle, then you have a larger area of possible profit. Regardless, you do have unlimited profit when you are sitting long a straddle or long a strangle. Um, that's shown on the upside, um, green arrows going both directions. You have a break even points uh, on both sides and then um, obviously your strike price in the middle. Again, you'll have these break even points on both sides as well here. When you are doing straddles, they are typically done at the money, which will typically make them zero delta. However, they don't have to be done at the money. You can place them wherever you want as long as the put and call prices are the same. Put and call strike prices, not um, options prices, but strike prices are the same. Uh, again, so when you are long options, you're going to be long gamma, long vega, and short theta. This will be magnified twofold because you are both doing that with the call and put. By being long two options, you'll be long twice as much gamma risk, twice as much vega, and twice as and short twice as much theta. All right, let's touch on butterflies and condors. So these obviously are going to look pretty similar to you, uh, given that they are um, basically the same things. However, you bought out the wings. This is the difference. So butterfly is a straddle with bought out wings. And then a condor is going to be a strangle with bought out wings. And when you say bought out wings, um, you've got the wings and the body over here. Now, this is a common term in trading. You'll see it in rates trading if you're doing like a one-to-one -one trade. Uh, so you have this extra weight placed in the middle and then protection on the downside and upside. On the condor side, it's the same idea. And you do have this wider area of uh, profit. However, as indicated by the graphic, this area is lower than where it would be here because of the lower premiums that you are collecting. Um, okay, so when you're long, you're along the wings and short the body. When you are long, obviously, if you're doing it at the money, you're going to have zero delta. If you move it, then it will move accordingly. So if you move this above the, uh, above the money, then you'll have, um, a long delta. If you move it below the money, then you'll have a negative delta. All right, let's bring it all together. Uh, to summarize vanilla options, we have long calls, um, short calls, long puts, and short puts. When you are long a call, you are delta long, vega long, gamma long, and theta short. When you are short a call, just literally reverse everything that we just discussed. When you are long a put, you are delta negative, theta negative, but long gamma and vega. Uh, long gamma and vega because it is a put. And then um, on the short put side, you are going to be long delta, long theta, short vega, and short gamma. So the Greeks um, from long puts as opposed to short puts are going to be exactly the inverse, just like from long calls to short calls, exactly the inverse again. These graphs are really important to note cold. Um, obviously, for a long call, the price is going to be ST minus K, positive part, um, minus this premium paid. And then when you are short a call, you're going to collect the premium and then be short that ST minus K component. Obviously, opposite holds for long call, uh, long puts and short puts, which are indicated by the graphics below. All right. Well, perfect. Thank you so much. Look forward to seeing you on Monday, October 19th for the next episode of Market News Flow. Thank you so much for tuning in and I uh, look forward to seeing you again soon.